I mean, again, thank you for everything that you've done. Um, you and like you said, thousands of others, uh, millions of others um, are doing the best that you can to affect this country and really the world uh, for the better. So can't thank you guys enough for that. Um, and really, this is more of just for everyone to better understand kind of what's going on. I feel like there's a lot of questions that people have um, about this thing and what kind of just what it is. I mean, for me, I, I'm hearing so many different things on the news of how serious it is. And I just want to get your professional opinion on really what COVID-19 is and what we're dealing with here. Sure, Sam. I mean, this is such a tricky virus. Um, it's a virus that we've known about for years and years. And usually in the United States, it causes the common cold because they're different strains of this virus, the way they're different strains of lots of viruses. But I don't know, you were too young to remember SARS, but it was um, an, a, a pandemic in a much smaller scale um, in, in, I think it was around 2008. And that was the same virus, but a different strain. So what this is a really tricky virus. It easily, easily passes from person to person, even more easily than influenza. And we think about flu as being very contagious. And what's so tricky about it and, and worrisome is you've probably heard there are people who have no symptoms at all, um, feel absolutely fine, have no idea that they're infected and they can transmit this virus to other people during that time. And then there are people who are incredibly sick. Um, and in the beginning, as we learned about it out of China, we predominantly thought, well, this affects people's lungs, but we're finding now it affects their kidneys, it affects their heart, it affects their nervous system. Um, and so depending on, on how ill you become from it, um, it can have devastating consequences, particularly in older people um, and particularly in people who have underlying medical conditions. But we're shocked to see absolutely young, healthy people who get into trouble. So um, it's it's um, chameleon-like. We we you know we it hides from us and those people who have no symptoms and can pass it, and then we have you know people who are so ill and we're working really hard to save their lives. Right, and kind of going off of that, like, what do you think? Um, just for someone who is feeling maybe they have allergies or maybe mm -hmm. it might feel like a cold, like should they go in and get tested? How should they handle that? Yeah, right now, um, until we, we can do more testing, although our testing capacity has um, improved and increased tremendously, people with mild symptoms probably should um, stay away from other people so that they don't spread the illness. But in general, unless you have more serious symptoms, you probably shouldn't be seeking medical care. But if you've got trouble breathing or persistent chest pain or confusion, um, you know, those are reasons that you should definitely seek medical care, high fevers, et cetera. But people who have allergic type symptoms, um, it's hard to know whether they're allergies, um, particularly if you usually have allergies at certain certain seasons versus whether or not they have something more serious. So I think doing what you should do when you're ill, which is basically not being around other people because you don't want to pass infections to other people. I feel like I'm sometimes confused on what I should be doing and, you know, what the right thing to do is because, um, you know, for a lot of us, especially over a super long period of time, staying at home just by yourself isn't, yeah. you know, it, it's hard to do, right? I yeah, want to go really to my family. To I want to, you know, see the puppy that we just got last year, you know? So um, what should we be doing on a daily basis to kind of keep this thing in check and make sure that it doesn't spread. And um, just on a daily basis, I guess, what can we be doing to, to limit how this thing spreads? Yep, Sam, that, that's a great question. That's an incredibly important question, which is, and it's the things that we've all heard again and again, but they're so key. So the issue of social distancing really is an important issue. So that's staying at least six feet away from other people. Um, and obviously, if you live with your family and everybody's been well and you've been together, you're not going to stay within six feet of them. But um, when you're out and you're doing some grocery shopping, if you have to go out or you're around people, um, it is important to stay at least six feet. And that's because of the way the virus is passed. I mean, you're much less, much less likely to be exposed if you social distance. The other thing is hand hygiene. There are all those basic things that we all learned growing up, but it's so important to wash your hands regularly, particularly if you've been out in public or you've been touching something that 
um, is you're not normally around. Um, the, this virus does live on certain surfaces for up to a certain a couple of days, although most commonly it's spread person to person. So, and washing hands, the CDC has some great um, films to remind people of how to do that. But it's at least 20 seconds, and you really have to um, you know wash them well and um, dry them with a paper towel, not a towel that somebody else has just used. Um, important also if you don't have ability to wash your hands, if you have the alcohol-based hand rubs, you should do that. You've also seen information recently because the CDC announced it recently that wearing a face mask um, or something to protect your eyes, um, well, your nose and your mouth is really important because the virus comes can come from your nose or mouth if you're blowing your nose or you're coughing or sneezing, um, if you happen to be infected, or if you're around other people, that droplet can actually, you won't see it, it's invisible, but it can reach your nose or your mouth. Or if you've touched the surface and you rub your eye, it can cause a problem. So it's really important to do those basic things, the social distancing, which is what you were talking about, how hard it is for people to be on their own, be home alone. I, you know, I've been away from my family a lot during the week um, and it's it's isolating. It's, it's it's difficult. Um, and then just making sure you're washing your hands regularly and the masks are important. Um, so it, it, right now I'm not in a hospital, so we're wearing the cloth face masks when I'm in an office building. But in a hospital, when I'm over there, then we wear obviously greater protection because there's a greater ex um, potential exposure. Right. And you mentioned the eyes for a second. The eyes... Yeah don't carry anything or nothing can spread through them or how does no they could and and so we worry most about the nose and the mouth but again if you touch a surface and then you rub your eyes there is a risk so it's really important to try to you know not rub your eyes or wash your hands right before you do so um and that would give you protection so okay. any of the three you know your eyes nose or mouth are all potential yeah and then um just curious because we're all very um, aware of how serious this is. And um, we're all super thankful for people like yourself and all the workers in hospitals. Um, so I guess my question would be, how are, how are you guys all taking care of yourselves? And, you know, in the hospital, what are you guys doing to protect yourselves and um, each other from not getting infected? Sure. Well, I, th I think the first and foremost is recognizing um, when somebody has symptoms that are consistent with COVID. So when somebody comes to a hospital, we have different paths that people enter the hospital. So people who are coming with symptoms that have nothing to do with COVID go um, enter our facility in one way, our emergency department. And then those who have symptoms that are suggestive of COVID will go another way. And that protects the healthcare providers and it can protects our patients. Um, in addition, we have specific personal protective equipment. I'm sure you've heard a lot on the news about yeah. that. Um, and so we wear special respirators um, that um, are particulate respirators that keep the virus out of our our mouths and, and breathing. So it goes over our nose and our mouth. We wear either face shields or goggles over our eyes. So you asked about eyes, it protects our eyes. We wear gowns that are impermeable. So um, it covers our, our clothing and we wear gloves. And there's not only do we wear them, there's a very specific way in which they're put on, which we call doffing, um, donning, I'm sorry, and then they're taken off. Um, and so doffing and donning is putting on and taking off the gowns and gloves. And so we literally have healthcare workers watching each other to make sure that they don't contaminate themselves when they're doing this. So the personal protective equipment is really important. Isolation, appropriate isolation, appropriate rooms, um, and then appropriate traffic control. It sounds like a funny word to use, but making sure that those people who are infected go to certain elevators, go through certain hallways, so that we make sure that we clean those areas appropriately and we don't risk um, infections among our healthcare providers, our healthcare um, workers, our team members, but also that we protect all our other patients. Because we are very concerned about patients being afraid to come to um, hospitals and doctor's offices, which is really catastrophic if they avoid that, that kind of visit and they need it. Right. And you mentioned certain ways to put on your gloves and your masks yep. uh, or something that can help kind of the public if they want to better sure. protect themselves. And yeah. That's a great question too, Sam. So, you know, masks can sometimes go over the ears and there are instructions that on the CDC website on how you can make your own. And so there's like elastic right. that goes around your ears. So when you're taking them off, you want to take it off by the elastic. You don't want to touch the front of the mask that you've you know, been exposed to outside. So it's really important it's removed carefully and taken off and that it's washed regularly in a hot um, washing machine cycle and a hot dryer. 
So having a couple of these face cover coverings is really important so that you can keep them clean. You can make sure that you're not touching them as you're putting them on and off. And if you use a tie one, same thing. You want to take it off by undoing the ties as opposed to touching the mask itself. And would you say the latex gloves are kind of the best gloves to use right now? No, I don't think they need to be latex. I think they can be regular vinyl gloves. They could be nitro gloves. They can be latex, whatever you would have available. Um, they'll all do the trick. Okay, cool. And then um, just curious on like if you get hurt or something like that. I know a lot of people, if they have certain injuries that they might have needed a surgery for, I, I know a lot of people are putting those off because they don't want to get sick or they don't want to get other people sick. Um, so kind of what are your tips for people who might have an injury or might need to go to the hospital for a different reason other than being sick? Yeah, this has been one of the things that's been so disturbing is over the past several weeks, we've been finding um, our emergency medical workers that go to people's homes when an ambulance is called have been finding you know people who didn't call an ambulance soon enough. And so we've been seeing deaths that we think were preventable, not just COVID deaths, but deaths because people were afraid to come to the hospital. There's some things that can wait. You know, if you need a total knee replacement and you've been waiting six months, you can and you don't have excruciating pain and you're not declining. There, there, there are many things that we can wait on and we will wait. But somebody who's been diagnosed with cancer who needs that cancer surgery or an injury that is acute, which you were describing, they need to come to the hospital. They need to call their doctor. They need to get the care that is appropriate for them. So one of the things that's changed during this whole pandemic is there is a, a great deal of virtual care available. So it's not unreasonable if it's not an acute injury to call your doctor and say, what should I do or have, make a virtual care appointment. But if you're having chest pain or you're have, or you've had a fracture or you've had, you know, had acute injury or you have a high fever, you've got to come to an emergency department. And we have worked incredibly hard, not only to keep our facilities, and this is national, safe for our healthcare um, teams, people providing care, but for those people coming to the hospital. So certain ways hospitals, even though everybody's afraid of, okay, they're patients with COVID there, certain ways they may be one of the safer places because we're working so hard to make sure the patients are in specific units if we're worried about them having COVID. They're not in the units where we're having our patients that we're not worried about being sick. And we're very vigilant about cleaning and the personal protective equipment that we wear. So that is one of the other, you know, really potential tragedies that we're already seeing is people dying unnecessary deaths because they're afraid of um, the medical system. So I really encourage you and everybody else to, to really be vigilant about how you are. And if you're having the problems and you have an acute injury or you have chest pain, please, you know, seek the emergency care that you need. So in terms of your family and potentially a family member getting sick, how should someone care for a family member that is sick and how should they go about, you know, making sure they protect themselves and communicating that to other people? This is one of the really hard things about an infectious disease um, and one that's easily spread is that if you are exposed to somebody who's known to have COVID, you need to quarantine for 14 days. And quarantine means not that you have symptoms, but that you are in, in the period of time in which you might become infected. So it does mean if you can, um, either being in a different location or um, if you have the room being in a different part of your house, trying to use a separate bathroom, having anybody in the house stay away from you, bring you food um, and leave it outside the door and walk away. All things that are incredibly hard to do. But that 14 day period is the time in which um, you may become um, infected and you have the potential for transmitting it to somebody else even before you have symptoms. So that's extremely important. And then for those people who do become ill but can stay at home, and 80% of the people with COVID are able to manage their illness at home, um, then they again have to isolate. And we call that isolation, not quarantine, because they do have symptoms and they have to isolate from their family. And the duration depends somewhat on their underlying medical conditions, et cetera. So I don't want to give advice on that. It's much more important to talk to the doctor, taking care of them and saying and asking the doctor to give them information about how long they should remain isolated. Wow. So very serious. And it's interesting how isolation and quarantine are different. Um, yeah. I, would hear, I would hear doctors like yourself talk about it on the news and I really fully wouldn't understand kind of what the difference between the two were. I thought they were just the same, but that's interesting to know what about the summer and how we should adjust mm -hmm. our behavior during a time when more people may be out active or returning to work. 
Yeah, I mean, part of this is going to be ten- totally on where you live um, and how active the disease is. And, and what's very um, typical of, of pandemics, not that they're typical events, is that um, the virus will move from community to community. So just as the mid-Atlantic states um, have been particularly hit hard, um, as you noticed, I'm sure, by watching um, the news and reading the paper, it's going to be moving to different parts of the country. So giving general advice, is it will depend a great deal on where you're living and how active the virus is. But I think the same tenants we've talked about are, are key, and that's going to be harder and harder as the weather gets nicer, but also as it gets really warm in places and it gets harder for people to stay inside. So depending on the density of where you live, it's going to be easier or harder to get outside and stay away from people. And that's really ideal if people are, you know, if you have a backyard, you're in a great position and you can go in your backyard and enjoy being outside. If you live in an urban area, that's a lot harder. And so it depends if things are really active and there's a lot of person to person spread, then we need to have people stay away from each other no matter what. Um, and that's, you know, we, we in New Jersey are living through exactly that situation where spring is beginning to come and um, we are being asked to stay inside, except when we have to do specific things. And then we're asked to do all of those things that I've talked to you about already. So summer is going to be complicated, um, but um, we just need to, you know, listen to what our public health authorities are telling us and uh, and use our common sense. Uh, and uh, really, really follow the advice of that I've given today in terms of social distancing, hand hygiene, et cetera. And staying yeah. inside, that's what's indicated, even if it's beautiful outside or hot inside. Yeah, I think for people to fully understand um, how important social distancing is, and especially when the weather gets nice, I know out here in Southern California, the beaches are starting to open up, rules are starting to change. Um, like you mentioned, people wanna go outside. Um, so I think the biggest thing, and if you have any information, which you probably do, um, on kind of how fast this thing can spread and how yeah. dangerous it really is. Um, if you have any statistics or numbers, um, just basic, super generic numbers that you could throw out at us to, you know, um, I'm not saying you have to scare us, but I yeah. think there's something to be said for, you know you might act a little bit different if you actually knew how fast this thing can actually spread. Yeah, this is a really highly communicable disease. I mean, it's it's really contagious. It's very easy to develop this infection. Um, and so when I say something's more contagious than influenza, um, there is a term medically called r not, which is how many people can become infected by a person. And in the beginning, that was over five in China. Then it dropped to 2.6. And I've read different things in the, in the country about that in the United States. And it, and it really is dependent on exactly the things we've been talking about, which is, and I'm not going to feel like silly saying it again, but it does have to do with our behaviors. So um, this is this is a disease that for some people is going to be as mild as having a seasonal um, cold. Um, and for other people, it is killing them. So it what we should be intimidated, we should be frightened by this virus enough to be sensible, enough to do the things that are going to protect us and our loved ones and our communities until we have a vaccine. So um, you don't want people to be so afraid that that you know they're they're anxious and not sleeping, which I know is happening for some people, and that's incredibly hard. But at the same time, one should respect how um, how um, serious this illness can be. Yeah, uh, this has been great. I mean, this has been super helpful for me, and I know it's going to be for a lot of people. Um, and so this is kind of the last question for me, and it's broad. Um, sure. What are uh, just the basic things, um, the most pressing things that we can do um, right now to, to be able to help this virus? I mean, I know social distancing is huge, gloves and yep. masks. Um, are there any other things that we can do as a society uh, to help prevent this from spreading? Yeah, I think getting the word out, which I think is something that you in your position will be better able to do than most, which is getting the word out about that this is going to take a long time, that we need to be patient. The ultimate um, solution for this is a vaccine. Um, vaccines take a long time to produce. Luckily, uh, we think that we'll be able to go faster than we've gone in the past because we've learned a lot about vaccine manufacturing in recent years. But um, 
this is for most of us, this is going to seem like a really long haul and will make such a difference if we do the things that we need to do during this time. So I, I know it's so saying the same thing again and again, but it's person to person spread. So if you're close to people, um, that's a potential way to transmit it. So all of the things we've talked about are really key. So promoting that um, and being in touch with your family members, your community, particularly if you're in a leadership role as you are, to really emphasize the importance of, of, of that. Um, accepting that you know you may have to work from home. Um, helping your neighbor. I mean, I've been so moved by stories of people who are you know have elderly neighbors and and have left them notes and said you know I'll, I'll go to the market for you and I'll leave things for you outside your door so you're comfortable. So those things that community people can do. We've been so overwhelmed by the community support at the Atlantic Health System hospitals, people bringing us, you know, having meals delivered, um, going out and, you know, certain hours and, you know, thanking the healthcare heroes. So I think both keeping the public informed and keep the message simple enough, just because this is such a complicated area. So people really understand what the basic things they need to do are, and then being supportive of, of, your neighbors seeing what you can do with your for your family and being supportive of the of the healthcare workers in the country because goodness knows this is a very challenging time for for everyone. Right, that's awesome. Um, I know this will help a ton of people, and I can't thank you enough for you know the time that you've spent not only here today uh, being able to explain this thing to us, but also you know just doing everything that you do every single day to to help prevent this thing from spreading. So um, thank you and you know, the entire Atlantic Health team for what sure. you guys have been able to do throughout this time. And thank you, Sam, for taking the time. I know you're incredibly busy and I am one of, you know, thousands and thousands. And um, I've been extraordinarily in awe of and impressed with what so many of um, our team members and all healthcare providers across the country and personnel have done. This is a this is a really difficult, challenging situation for all of us. So thank you, thank you for giving the visibility it needs to help people keep people safer. Absolutely.